my name is Shi Yi. I am the headmaster here of the Shaolin Temple Europe located in Germany. And approximately since 11 years, I'm trying out a lot of different ways how to get a very important message out to the people who are interested. My name is Shi Yanming. I'm a 34th generation Shaolin Temple warrior monk. I'm the founder and the abbot of USA Shaolin Temple. My name is Yan Lei. My master gave me his name. But I think this name suits for me because yeah, when you want people to know you, you look like thunder. People will know you. Uh, I tell myself, you don't have any luck. You have to work hard. You make yourself sunny. People will see you because you are the lights. People will find you. So this, this is my character. Over the years, I've got the pleasure of sitting down with some great Shaolin masters and teachers. We've shot over 20 different interviews and 30 hours worth of footage. So today, I've put together my favorite moments from these Shaolin teachers and masters from all around the world, from Germany to London to the United States of America. Here's that video. Today's video was made possible at mulliganbrothers.com where we are having the end of year sale. Use code 2024 at checkout with the link in the description for buy one get one free across the Not A Journal, the Success Journal that actually leads to success and the Memento Mori posters, the posters behind me that remind you, you will one day die. That's my life plotted out there and it is one of the most powerful tools ever. And also the t-shirts and hoodies. All of the proceeds from the website make this possible. That's how we get our film crew around the world to be able to create these projects. Let's dive into it. I think something we spoke about a lot actually, but never put this terminology on it. And I don't, I don't know if you know of it by this terminology, but the law of attraction and how to use the law of attraction to manifest things into reality. I heard about this terminology before the law of attraction. I don't know necessarily how you would define it. But as I understand it, in a way it is about, let's say, how to make something manifest that you want. If this is the case, then for me, starting very easily again, it starts with the smallest area inside of yourself. It starts with the smallest aspect. Let's just take it as the world of thoughts. But the world of thoughts is not graspable. The only one who knows about it is yourself. So wanting to manifest something is now the question, how can you start expressing what you feel deep inside of yourself in such a way that the world of forms start to mirror it. And so what you again therefore want is, it's about harmony. You actually want that something which is sitting inside of you gets into direct resonance with what we have available on the outside. And I don't think there is a magic formula for this. What I know is that 100% hard work helps. Simple like this. So I wouldn't say that just think about it, just make your wishful thinking, just make your prayers, depending on what type of prayers. But having something that you really want, spending your time to already manifest it in the mind as good as you can, meaning make it feelable. Make your thought already start to go into the area of you can feel it. You can feel it, how it has entered your life. This is already a first step of, okay, now it's not just thinking about it, now you even feel it. It maybe is not there material-wise, but you can sense already what type of an energy and in, in, in which type of fluctuation within the flow of life actually that wish would put you. Okay. So that means you visualize something maybe or 
you go into deep prayer about this thought that you have. Okay? This is what I regard as being a prayer. It's not just talking words. It's about diving in and trying to create that feeling, calling up, cultivating that thought that it really starts to become feelable. So this is one of the initial steps. What we have right now is what you are thinking and what you're feeling already starts to be still in harmony. Okay? And now practice and continuously and with patience. Stay with it. If it's important to you, stay with it. Keep on cultivating it, slowly, slowly, but give yourself some time. Everything that happens too quickly, which is changing the status quo too quickly, first of all, it's not helpful for us and it most of time is also destructive. But if you really want something, I think this is the way. Slowly, steadily, wholeheartedly. Wholeheartedly meaning what? There is no doubt there. You are not doubtment. There's no doubt. It just means it hasn't manifested like in the way that it's right in front of the eyes. But just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. But why so pure-heartedly? Because only the heart is the one that is, let's say, connecting us humans together. Only the heart is like that area that I would regard as giving the possibility of connecting. The heart is like the highest instrument, if you would say like this, the highest antenna to spread out the connection. And if you are sending from the heart the signals out to the universe that there is something that that there is something you would like to receive. I think the best way to express it is when it comes from the heart. So that means because you already have it inside of you, because the heart is the magnet, because it's magnetic, that's why it pulls. That's why it pulls. Yeah, I express it now again, maybe a little bit fluffy again, but it attracts the energy which is surrounding all of us to finally manifest what thought, what emotion and what feeling and what wish and desire you have inside of that heart. It's pulling it towards you. And this is why now when energy, strong energy, starts to come into your life, well, in order for something to be created, we need a lot of energy. So the ultimate question is always, if you want to manifest something into your life, you need energy for that. And what is the highest energy in this universe that we have? Some people call it sexual energy or it is love. It is the energy that carries the potential to create life. This is normally what happens when two people come together and then go into a partnership, go into a bond and create out of love new life. There is no other energy that can create new life. Two people hate each other, how they create new life? Two people are jealous amongst each other, how they create life? No, there's only one thing. And so law of attraction, or however it's called, I think it is based upon these type of thoughts. I don't know specifically, but once you are the magnet, you're pulling something towards you. This goes for all the positive things that you feel during the day or what you're cultivating, but especially like the negative. And I think even, yeah, maybe if you are constantly thinking about, worried about, fearful about something, this fear already went so strong that you feel it 
on a daily basis. And then you're wondering why it happens. This is also that sentence about the, how you call it, the self-fulfilling prophecy. So self-fulfilling prophecy, law of attraction, for me, I think they belong to the same category right now. It's just when we talk about attraction, we relate it a little bit more to something that's a positive, because people m most of the time want to attract something positive. Nobody wants to attract something negative. But if it is negative, well, then it's a prophecy. It's the same. Both of these things coming somehow from the same principle that makes this possible to happen. The yin and the yang. Electric, magnetic. One spreading outwards, one pulling towards. The forces of the universe. The forces upon which our existence, our way of thinking, our way of feeling, our way of acting, our way of behaving is always, always and always based upon. You talk, you bring the message out, you send something out. You send something out, yeah, other people receive it. Some people are electric, other people become magnetic. And this is that constant idea, of course I talk in pictures, but as soon as you are able to relate something about your life to this duality, then you know, okay, you are embedded into this way of life as well. You are part of all of this. So it makes sense to figure out for yourself what is there more. Okay. Then also now, duality is like the very beginning, yeah? It's like yin and yang, this is what people know. Easy way also, now you have the symbol right in front of you. On the one side, the black half fish, on the other side, the white half fish. And now you draw a cross, right, with a, through the circle. So you have four areas right now. And there, what do you see? There is a small black area and a large black area. There's a small white area and a white and a large white area. Where the large white area ends, the small black one begins and vice versa. So the message is there is not just duality. If you now dive deeper into it, you even see different transition phases. This is now the next step. There is a transition happening in the moment you are reaching a certain, a certain valley or a certain peak. If you have reached the top of the mountain, there's only one direction where it will go. Once you know this, once you can sense it in your own life, in your different life areas, how is it... Uh, professional-wise, in your professional life? Where are you standing? Do you have the feeling you are like in small growing mode? Are you already in super high expansion? In which state are you already, relation-wise, physical-wise, physical mental health-wise? No matter, there are so many areas where you can actually relate this model now to. But it just gives you an additional idea that, first of all, what is most probable to happen next or what are the possibilities that can happen next. Yes, And this is now the part where philosophy, old teachings, I think, can be used for application, but not for knowing. So knowing these things and being able to talk years long about what the philosophy behind it is good. These are so-called professors maybe. But the main part is to find a way to relate all of these teachings into your life. You are the one who is supposed to benefit from these teachings. The ones that wrote it, the ones that delivered all of this, they're not here anymore in this world. They left it here in case they left it for you to get the message and make it better than them maybe did it.
that's the reason why normally you want to leave something in this world in order to let's say support the upcoming generations to not go through all the mistakes and challenges and and difficulties you might have uh, you might had to face so it's always about your life it's never about blindly following something just because somebody told you to follow I, one thing I wanted to start with is doing the research there was mention of uh, your gr your growing up in rural China and like for somebody like me and also people in in the US like could you explain what rural China was like growing up in that in that situation and you know for somebody who wouldn't know what that was like absolutely I grew up like in China back to 1960s I was born in 1964, year of the dragon. During that time, uh, two years later, a Chinese Cultural Revolution started. 1966 until 1976, Chairman Mao died. The revolution ended. During the 10 years, a Chinese Cultural Revolution was terrible, horrible. The words you can describe were bad. Yeah. The parents were against their children. The children were against their parents. Everybody was killing each other. And millions of people been killed by just like a family against each other, people were against each other. And the worst of the time in the history. Your connection to the Shaolin Temple from that was uh, your parents of, and, and your, your two older siblings, you'd, had, had, your parents had lost them through f the famine, through right. for starvation. Yes. And then something similar happened to yourself and you found yourself at the Shaolin Temple. Could you talk through that story? Absolutely, I'll give you a story. <laughs> I had two brothers died. One sister died during the Chinese uh, Great Leaf Forward, back to, nine, back to 1958, 59, 60s. I haven't born yet. And Chinese government are killing themselves, lie to themselves. We have all the food to feed our people. We have everything, we're rich. That was completely lying. That's why a lot of people didn't have food to eat. That's why I had two older brothers died. One older sister died. Also my father almost died. The stomach, you know, he told me a story uh, like this, or gaze, almost blow up his stomach. He ate barks from tree, he ate leaves from tree, he ate grass. That time people ate people, believe it or not. It was a terrible, terrible time in China. And then yourself as a baby, the, the way you found the Shaolin Temple was your parents incredible story. I thought that you'd passed away and then you were met by a, whilst your parents were perceivedly grieving you, they met by acupuncturists. The story had taken place. When I was an infant, I was very sick. My parents tried everything, tried to save me life. Unfortunately, they couldn't do anything. On the way to my little dead body way, luckily, Luckily, you know, on the way to submit little body way, you know, did, didn't have enough money to buy little, little coffin, for example. Just use the blanket to wrap my body. My parents were crying so hard. And the one person said, let me take a look. Maybe there's a chance you can bring your son's life back. Yeah, acupuncture. Some call <laughs> bring me uh, precious life back. Yeah. Two years later, at age five, my parents took me to the Shaolin Temple. Yeah, back to the 1970s. And as a five year old going to the Shaolin Temple, what was that experience like? Experience like it. Shaolin Temple didn't have a wall at that time. All the cows, pigs, and sheep, everybody can go in. Basically, Shaolin Temple, the little village, was poor. Also, during the Chinese 
cultural revolution, the Red Guards, not only went to the Shang Temple, they went to different Taoist temple, wherever Muslim mosques, uh, uh, Muslim was, ma mosque, whatever, went to different temple, different religions, destroyed them all, including Shang Temple. All the pagodas, they destroyed, they destroyed all the buildings, even the pagodas were over one thousands after you know during the Chinese uh, uh, cultural, cultural revolution ten years, the Red Guards have destroyed most pagodas. You see the pagodas right now, they rebuilt it after nineteen eighties. Even Shang Temple rebuilt it after nineteen eighties. The Shang Temple movie come out nineteen eighty two. Yeah. Before nineteen eighties, Shang Temple was empty. Only a few all the building left. Leaking. When, when God was happy, when God was raining, the building was leaking at that time. When you arrived uh, five years old and you know people are actively trying to destroy the Shaolin message, the Shaolin teachings, yeah. how much of the teachings were based in uh, protecting the message, protecting, you know, carrying this message forward under any circumstances? I carry the message. I carry the spirit. Yeah, that's why now I teach people. You're the temple. You're the monastery. You're the church. Yeah, wherever you go to, you carry the spirit with you. Yeah. Most of the time, basically, monks cannot stay in the, inside the temple. Red guards say, get out. Get out. Everybody has to get out of some temple. Even Doris temple. Yeah, everybody has to get out. Go home, marry. Yeah. Everybody has had I had to believe Chairman Mao's philosophy. Mao's philosophy was all the religions were ghost, yeah, God, garbage, snake. We should wipe them out, wipe them off, clean them up, clean them up, sweep, sweep them out, yeah. Believe his philosophy. Everybody has had to study his philosophy at that time was terrible, yeah. Just reading through sort of your life story, how you, especially the early days and what your parents had to go through, like. Yeah, my, my parents it tried to, so hard, tried to, to save me life. And my, my father tried to look for different masters, different schools, tried to let me get educated, not, you know, martial arts. For, for example, Chinese culture, I study. My, I got a lot. And courage and blessings, not one from, from Buddha and from my father. Yeah. My father was my hero. Yeah. My father was homeless. Every, every day, life, <laughs> door by door, asking for food to keep life. Yeah. At age 19, he became the Chinese government. Yeah. Chinese government. Yeah. And he, he can read, he can speak, and he can and calligraphy, he, he can calligraphy, yeah. was, he was genius. For us, our, our mission, we, we feel, is to share people's stories from all around the world, because it's that that inspires change in people, positive impact in people, whether it's teachings or messages. And I, I love the idea that you wouldn't be doing this work right now if it wasn't for your father, who inspired you to, you know, you say he was a hero to you. Uh, I mean, could we hear more about, uh, about your dad? My dad was genius. Genius also dis disciplined me very, very harsh, very hard. I was a genius, I say that. I was genius even now. <laughs> I also describe myself, the most handsome, the most handsome, the Shang Temple warrior monk on the planet. Even I was a child. I was, I did something you, could, you can not imagine. Yeah, a genius, a lot of crazy things. Yeah, I was, I was a leader. <laughs> For example, I gave you an example. I tricked people, digging a hole on the road. After digging a hole, make, make, make sure the hole been covered, looks normal. You walk on it, boom, it's, it's, I truck people. I did a lot of crazy things, yes. Yeah. Just for fun? I love it, just for fun, yeah. yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> yes. And so in the, in the Shaolin Temple, in those early days, what did a typical day look like? Like how, what, the training, what time did you wake up? What were you eating? Tec tec typical like at the Shaolin Temple that time. Typical time looks like uh, at the Shaolin Temple that time. Total different now. Yeah. Before 1980s, even, even after Shaolin Temple movie come out, 1982, Shaolin Temple not a, like people thinking, a sacred place, not like that. Not like the movies, you know, and people talking about it. In people's brains, already gave monks belief, gave monks respect, you know. They believe monks, you know, were like a god, like a untouchable, like, you know, cannot plant their feet on the ground. Very, you know, Le like levitating, <laughs> live life in the air. No, that's not real life. That's not reality. The reality is truth. Everybody has to eat food. Everybody eat food, everybody has to use toilet. Everybody drink water, everybody has to go to pee. That's real. And before 1980s, basically, there's no exactly such a schedule. Yeah, whatever you get up, you get up. You train, you train. Try to thrive. Yeah. Try to keep your life. Yeah. Of course, later on, you know, China opened to the world, especially when the movie come out. That people come from around the world visiting Shaolin Temple. And Shaolin Temple has to make like an image. Oh, get up off the bed for early and pray. I'm um, tall for. For example, yeah. Before that, no, no schedule. Yeah, I've been real. I love the fact that you, you talk so honestly about it as well. Understand, first respect yourself. Other people can respect you. Be honest with yourself. Other people can be honest with you. That's like a both sides, not only one side. Yeah. yeah. I've heard you talk about now, is in Shaolin teachings, it's a little bit softer. They can't be as disciplined or as, a, I don't know what the word would be, but I mean, people would say it was abusive now or child abuse, what you had to go through. <laughs> I mean, what was that sort of training like? Like, was it like do thousands and thousands of push ups or was, it, was there anything in particular? Protective training, like in the Western world, we believe, like, like abuse your child. Yeah, you know. Abuse. But it, it, in different country, different culture, and different philosophy, and to, to, uh, to different philosophy, to knowledge their child, to give knowledge to, uh, to their people. But I appreciate that. You know, for example, I was, like, I was like a monkey. I was so genius, playful, and trick people. I've been punished by my, my parents, by my teachers, different masters. As, for example, go stretch. Okay, get down. You don't get down. A teacher just hold your, your little body, your shoulder, to legs, boom, like this. That's what these days look. This, this is, this is appreciation. This is appreciation. My parents, my, my different masters. You gave me love. Of course, like, you know, for example, different words for abuse, not abuse, in my, in my heart, in my life. It's love, it's courage, it's knowledge. That's what I carry on that. I appreciate that. I represent Shaolin. That's why I describe myself the most handsome, the warrior monk on the planet. Yeah, not only Shaolin Temple warrior monk, the monk. You're speaking philosophy, I can demonstrate. It demonstrates speaking philosophy. That's why Shaolin Temple we call Chuan Chan Yi Ti. Physical, mental are one. Yeah. You can speak, it's beautiful, but demonstrate. And Shaolin Temple is new, it's only, only Shaolin Temple. It's different Buddhist temple on the planet. Yeah. You speak about martial arts, it's not martial arts. You speak in philosophy, it's not philosophy. You speak in martial arts, it's philosophy. You speak in philosophy, it's martial arts are one, one body. You cannot separate them. 
If you're enjoying this compilation from the Shaolin Masters, please consider supporting us at mulliganbrothers.com. Use code 2024 at checkout for buy one, get one free across everything on the website, including the Not A Journals, the success journal that actually leads to success, and the Memento Mori posters, the posters that remind you you're gonna die. You can mix and match across the t-shirts and hoodies as well. Link down below for buy one, get one free. Let's dive back into it. Something that just links to that that I found interesting what you were speaking about earlier is the idea of suicide and it, be, it being, um, I guess I guess some people make the confusion that that is the escape of suffering, that death death is the escape of suffering. I mean, what is your opinion on, you know, we have a, probably a growing suicide rate right now on why that's the case and what, what people are going through at the moment? No, in a way, it's it's sad to just realize that sometimes people have the feeling that there is no other escape than that one. Already that there are people existing that are so desperate and are so much under pressure of having this type of feeling that there's no other escape than that one. That's already a sad story by itself no matter where that pressure come from. I mean now, um, one of, of the highest rates, as far as I know, is also, for example, Japan. Yes, and over there, very often also related to failing at work. Now, this is Japanese culture, it's nothing I uh, would like to talk about because there are other specialists who know way more about it in the way also of what type of um, values they have. But there, one reason why people commit suicide, let's say, is also because of shame. They cannot take the shame of having, um, of having failed, let's say, in a certain area. But this is very much now related to a certain codex that you uh, have put upon yourself. But when we now switch away from Japan and go to the Western nations, over here the suicide is not being done because of shame. I don't think many of them are because of shame. There might be some cases, but the other ones is just They see no other option. It's like a one-way street. And this is something that I think with the opening of possibilities, they need to be educated just in the same way. That's all, that's all what this is about. People need to know options. If nobody puts additional options in their minds, they cannot see it by themselves. And yeah, it's it's really a difficult topic. I don't I don't know what to say to this, to be honest. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested. Do you feel that we've covered all the lessons from from this, like this ritual of tea? Um, do you think there's there's something else there? I, I, I don't want to skip over everything whilst we've got you here in this ceremony. I'd love to just make sure we're covering all bases. So. You know, this way also when we are having our food ceremony, mm. so before eating, we also have like a small prayer, which actually is expressing the same that we also talk about uh, right now over here. Meaning, from time to time, to be reminded, there is a story behind all of this. There is a story behind the food. Because, Intention is what fuels life. Intention fuels life. So in the moment where you are eating a type of food, there is a difference if, there, if you have some connection to the food that you're putting into you, or if you blindfold it, just do that one. Just that at the end the stomach is full and you have the feeling of fullness. I am 100% convinced that there is a different 
way of how your body eventually is going to process the food that you were eating with a filled intention in comparison to the food that just like you don't even know exactly what it was. It just filled the stomach. And so that is what I mean is you want to have quality life. And that automatically only means for me you fill up every moment and everything that you do, you are the one who fills it up with quality. You don't wait for anything to happen to make something be out of quality. You are the one, we are the one who can fill up whatever we're doing with quality. And in this monastery, it's in the eating. It's in the drinking the tea. It's during the meditation lessons. It is during the physical training. Everywhere we try to put as much as we can that reminder inside again. Be mindful. Know what you're doing. Put intention behind it. Don't do things empty. Don't do a movement empty. If you are not in the mood to do the training, do something else you're in the mood to do. That's not what I always say, but sometimes I do that. If I can see already somebody is in the training room and his energy is not correct, his mind is not there, is useless. Yeah. Sometimes they have other things on the mind that they would maybe prefer to do, or they still have some work on the mind where they think it's important, but uh, I cannot focus, then I better let them do that. Because the important part, no matter what it is, it is that reminder, it is up to your intention. It is your thoughts that is fueling the quality of life. And therefore, these are always just reminders and yeah and now coming from the cu cultural side let's say because in asia anyway we drink so much tea this is why always when drinking tea and seeing the cup seeing the tea again it's sooner or later it's like subconsciously already you know oh that's the mindful time because, of course, it would be a lie to say that even if we are here in the monastery, that 24 hours you're mindful. No, normally we are not. No human is. That's why we need to have structures, we need to have some method to, to reconnect us again, that remind us again. Remember, mindful. Mindfulness is key. Intention is key. So everywhere, hidden inside this whole complex of the monastery, we have this idea of be mindful. That's why like behind you, you see all these different instruments of the, of the gongs and uh, it's our so-called sound altar behind there. Traditionally, not from Shaolin. But meanwhile, we have so many different people coming here that they are reacting differently to certain methods. Some people like the breathing meditation or the moving, the moving arts. Some people understand the message by drinking tea. And other people understand the message by following a sound. Because no sound, again, is ever the same. It's like something slowly builds up and something slowly disappears. Just like everything. And this is why there are so many different so-called meditation methods. And we used to say, okay, you don't want to do Kung Fu, you don't want to do Qigong, you don't want to do Tai Chi Chuan, you also don't like the sitting meditation. Yeah, let's try out maybe listening, using the sounds as an object for your meditation. Maybe that is something that can recalibrate you, re-remember yourself again. There's a different key for each door. And sometimes this is the role, let's say, of a teacher to sometimes figure out which one is the right key 
to open that one person. And that's why we call it, it is the closest way in this area where we are right now, is what we call the direct transmission. There are some things you can of course um, share on videos or share through books, but there's also something which ultimately can only be shared when flesh to flesh, human to human, sit next to each other. Mm -hmm. That is what we call, it's the direct transmission. Yeah, I, th I, th I think just the idea of transferring these teachings to be mindful in day-to-day -day life, like the, everything that you spoke about today, the ritual, the, you know, the thinking about the process of how this tea got here, the uniqueness of every single cup of tea, um, how do we apply that to, or how would you feel that people should apply that to their everyday lives? I think it's time to really give sense, to give purpose and to give an understanding to the things that you are encountering in this lifetime. In this talk, for example, today, we mentioned already very often mindfulness. That word is out in this world so often right now. But take your time and think about it. What does it actually refer to? How can you personally use that word in, com in combination with, with what I just try to, let's say, express over here? Mindfulness is not the absence of thoughts. You are not trying to get rid of the thoughts. Mindfulness means your mind is full mind full, but it is full of something that you chose, you individually chose. This is my purpose. This is my intention of why I'm doing something. You do your work, put some intention behind it. You are speaking to a person, be clear about your intention. Why are you speaking to the person? You are texting something, be clear about what is your intention, why are you typing it. And stop doing stuff in this world that doesn't mean anything to you and that has no intention. Because the whole point about why do I need this intention? Because only intention mobilizes energy. And why do we need mobilized energy? Because only mobilized energy is creating something. What do I mean? If you continue doing stuff without intention, the result is going to be the same. You create nothing. Yeah, so it, it's like you, you never sent the messages because they were empty. And so this is the moment now where f you practice from the moment you wake up in the morning. Don't do unnecessary things. Brushing the teeth is not unnecessary. There is a purpose behind it. There is an intention behind this. You want your teeth to be healthy. That is an intention. You drink the coffee. You would like that you wake up a little bit more and be a little bit more active. Why do you want to be a little bit more active? Because with that extra power, with that extra energy, you can work more efficiently. You can um, work more. You can work better. You can do more things the whole day long. And why would you want that? Because you want to help. We want to contribute to something bigger. There is a whole range of intention that each individual can put into his daily life. Yeah? I can't say what are you supposed to, uh, what type of intention you're supposed to put in there. That is the special part. That it is not about what you do. It is about how you do the stuff. 
how you are writing the messages, how you are communicating with people, how you are walking through this lifetime. It doesn't matter what you do, it's the how. And this is something which is way bigger than, than, keeping, than keeping it limited to a Shaolin temple. It's just that within this temple, we have our ways. But the underlying principle is not limited at all to this organization only. It's something which belongs out there to the humans to know. It's just that that special part, why I'm so enthusiastic sometimes about this topic is that I'm so happy that it still exists in this type of knowledge inside this temple. But now growing up in the monastery and at the same time in this Western world, I see this one is missing out there, but it belongs out. Mm -hmm. And this is why my, my wish was always to find this combination that maybe started in the East or is found in the East, but it needs to come back. Because in essence, it is not separated. It's just, I don't know, got blocked or got lost or whatever. But this needs to come out. He was given the name um, Lee, which tr translates, I believe, this, I think, I think, yeah, I think, yeah. to thunder. Yes. Is that to do with the way you fought, or is it is it no, nothing to do with it, or is it your ma your master gave you that? Name? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's my master gave me his name, but I think suit suit uh, this name suit for me because uh, it suit my character because I'm young. Nobody pay attention to me. So when I'm learning the fighting, most time I'm lose, yeah. So I tell myself, you just didn't work hard enough. Yeah, when you want the people to know you, you like thunder, people will know you. So you always, um, uh, I tell myself, you don't have any luck. You have to work hard. You make yourself sunny, people will see you because you are the lights, people will find you. So this, this is my character. So I still know um, when I'm 50, I still push myself training. Um, I can't say every day, at least I train six days a week because I got a dream. Yeah, it doesn't matter which my dream or not. I enjoy the journey because I know my life never go wrong because I got a target. Yeah, I focus my target. Um, um, I don't know when I will reach it, but I know I will not lost my discipline because I got a target. I love it, that's so applicable to everybody. Like even a bit in business, like that is so yeah. applicable. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you was, what is uh, Shaolin, is it Qigong? What, is it, what does Qigong mean? When you do the physical, for example, when you do the, when you, when you do the uh, push up, squats, or you do the weightlifting, okay, you just use your body. Yeah, use your body to create, make your muscle bigger, make your muscle tough, whatever you're doing. But uh, you never practice your organs, yeah? You never try how to make your lung better, how to make your liver better, how to make your kidney better. But Qigong is try to focus inside your organs. But the, of course, I use, also use different movement to make your lung, or your liver, everything open, make circulation move properly. For me, the martial arts, the Qigong is martial arts, not separate for me, it's all one sense. But, <clears throat> you know, the life have different kind of people. Someone work really hard, someone don't want to work really hard. So <laughs> when people don't want to work hard, they choose something, they think they can do it. Qigong is not, they don't, they don't need, you don't need to have stamina, so you can do it. Yeah, you don't need to be strong, you can do it. Yeah, so this reason people choose the Qigong. But for me, it's not Qigong not strong, it's you are not strong. You can do Qigong very, very strong way, but you don't know how to do it because your body not strong. Yeah, for example, <laughs> if you want to change your body, you have to work hard. 
You do push up, you make your arm strong. I say push your hand as hard as, as you can. Yeah, but you don't have strength. So you can't push hard. It's limited. So you just mean you can't open your body. So for me, you need to mix it together. Yeah, physical, you train your body, you use the body, you train your body, you use the body, and you look after your body. Mix together. People go to gym, train their body, use their body, finish. They don't do anything, like, they don't lock up their body. So this reason, when you're young, you're fine. When you're older, you got trouble. If you do lifting, uh, lifting weight a lot, and after you don't stretching, your body will be stiff. You muscle up, but you're stiff. When you're older, your life quality dep not depends how much muscle you have, depends your organs how strong, and depends your body how flexible. Yeah, depends these two important things. Yeah, after of course your strength is also important because you lose your strength, your joints are very weak. Yeah, but the other two is important. Not that you have a lot of muscle. When you're old, when you look at people 90 years old, they, they don't have muscle, correct? They, they lost. Yeah. But if you can lose the muscle, but you don't lost your flexibility, you don't lost your organs, you just make your life can go in longer. <clears throat> Talk about strength. Um, I've seen some of your demonstrations online yeah. Um, yeah. where you have big sticks broken yeah. on your body. And how, how do you train for that? And what, what's a demonstration supposed to represent? I'm, I'm seriously, I'm not training for broken that sticks. This is for performance. This is the easiest thing to do. Uh, broken sticks because you, number one, you choose that stick that can break. Some stick you never can break, they're so tough. So it's performance. Just say your body uh, tough than normal people. It didn't mean anything for me. I'm practicing this is for when I'm young, I practice for fighting. I can take people punch, kick me. Yeah. When I'm old, I practice for circulation. Yeah. So when you use the uh, stick or whatever, bamboo brush, metal brush, beat your body. It looks like a massage that makes your circulation move. Yeah, for me, um, for me, when people kick me, kick my leg, when, I, uh, when I'm teaching students, when I have long distance run, I always after let my students kick my leg because for me, it looks like a good message for me. Sound looks like a joke, but it's true. For me, I can make my leg feel better because circulation moves. Um, yeah. How you don't mind me saying there's a few, you've got a few scars on your body, is that through practices of...? Uh, no, when, we, so when I'm 18, uh, 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 I'm working in uh, a um, nightclub, um, you know, my first job, because number one, when you go to temple studying martial arts, you need to pay money, <laughs> okay, not for free, yeah? Maybe you're teaching for free, but you need to pay your food. So I need to get money, so I need to go, I go to the... Uh, nightclub. My job look like uh, I click money. When they finish, I take the bank. It's my job. So nobody know me. I'm just in the corner. So it's from a uh, street fight. So it's knife uh, because uh, you know it's long. It's long story. Uh, uh, for me, everything happened for me. I always tell myself, anything happen have reason. You know. That day don't make sense. One day will make sense. For me, that makes sense for me is because, um, you know, it, life, you have problem, you have problem, you know, you can't always, they didn't kill my confidence. It just happened. I can't make me learning, you know. Uh, when you have problems, if you can fight, you fight. You know, if you can't fight, you run away. You have no choice. You have to fight as hard as you can. So that fight is really, really hard because people, they, they follow me. They know where I'm going. They track me in the wrong restaurant, knife, bottle, everywhere. So they got maybe 15 people. I'm one. So, so I'm, I, I didn't kill me. They, they, that day they wanted to kill me, but they didn't. That for me is, uh, um, you know, People uh, like the monk talk about the Buddhism. Sometimes I don't like this because if you life have no story, 
What kind of experience you can teach me? You said Mount, you said Temple, all your life. Even you don't know people、uh, work so hard to get food. Sometimes you think this man, you know, he's no respect. He just beg people money. You don't know how tough before his life. You can't judge them. You can't say this to to them because you don't know them. Don't judge them. So、uh, you know, some people they they always think about the monk. They can talk good Chan Buddhism. For me, it's no, not everyone. Some, yeah.、Uh, you, I, I, I see lots of famous monk. You know,、um, the most time before they married, they got tough life. It means they got、uh, suffering. They, they, they understand life. So they learn from the mistake. They learn from the suffering. They, I believe them. If they talk some sense, I believe with someone they say they stay temple. Since they turn, it's just shut up. You don't know the life because you don't need to worry the food. People give to you because people respect you. You in the temple, you know. If you grow your hair, <laughs> put your normal clothes on the street, you try to make ten pounds. I guarantee someone they can't make it. The worst that people beg people money, even because they don't want to lose their face. Anyway, I think it's talk too much for this. No, no, I love it. I, I love it. I think it's so true. Life, <coughs> life's really tough. Like、yeah. life is really, really, really tough. And、uh, so I mean, that day, did you, like how close was you? To, you say fifteen people attacked you. Yeah. Like was that and tried to kill you? Just tried because. Did they get close? Uh, I can't say because everything happened very quickly. You know, in five minutes, everything happened. You know, it, it just because I'm the fighter, I know people follow me. So in my heart, I prepare myself because I know I've been with people. People, what quote? They, they, they. How to say? They surround you. Surround you.、Yeah. You know. You feel it. You know it's time. You have no choice because you have to. Tell yourself that time you are not human being, you are the animal. You they want to kill you. You have to take everything you can do it, and try to beat them quickly, run away. I, I'm lucky. I just、uh, most injured. This is this arm here, and here, broken. My arm broken. It's a funny sense. And when、uh, when this arm broken. So I think this arm is finished. But most time when I'm China, I'm a fight. All the, my left hands lock people out, not my right one. <laughs> Do you think that your、uh, kung fu practices and your discipline saved you that night? Like, w- do you think you would have been? It, like, yeah, I think is of course my kung fu and the discipline, also my character. And、um, tough, you know. You 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 have no choice. You tell yourself, you have no choice. I mean, no choice. It didn't mean bad thing. No choice mean you have to give everything you can because you have no choice. Only you give everything you can. Result, you don't care anymore because it's all you have. Is that is that the way you you live your life now to work towards your goals? Like you have no, like you give everything you can. Yes, because I said.、Um, You know, I come to this country when two、uh, thousand. I come come to country. I make DVDs. I have no money. But I tell you, I tell I said before, if you sh- if you signing, people will come to you. They said I can help you. I can film you for free. Because you work hard, people see it. You know, they want help you.、Uh, This is my character. Then I make DVDs. I write in book. I make a movie by myself. Everything I do my by myself. I do online editing by myself. Be- I can't editing. I don't know how to editing. Then not editing. <laughs> Stamina. You know. You don't need editing. Don't need to cut, cut, cut. One go through straight away.、Uh, it's for me. Life don't need to be that tough. But for me, because I said it's because I, my background make me thinking that way. Yeah, everything、um, I need to prepare myself. Prepare didn't mean、uh, pr- for me. Prepare is give everything you can to make yourself ready. Yeah.、Um, uh, now I'm stop teaching、um, group people. Uh, even I 
we also um, don't teach one to one often, um, but I focus teaching online. I want to tell myself, maybe I'm not best teacher, but I want to be. Yeah, this reason I wait to make myself become best example for that moment. Yeah, because uh, uh, <laughs> I tell my students, if you want to learn some skill with somebody, you know, um, fighting skills, don't look the past. Don't look, just look now. Yeah, if someone they say they're good, you look the body, <laughs> they changed. It means they lost the discipline. Okay, then it's no good example. Yeah. But you still can learn with them, but tell yourself it's his no good example. You learn something you want to get. Don't judge them. Just learn something you want to get from them. Yeah. So for me, um, <laughs> this is my character. Everything I want to do it, I want to give everything I can. What one thing we get a lot of comments about is ego. Um, it's you know spoken about very negatively. Um, and a lot of people are asking, how do they overcome their ego? I'm just wondering what your opinion is on it and your, yeah, what you have to say about it. The way how I understand ego and if I hear these words, it's for me very close related to identification. If there's nothing you are identifying yourself with, I think it's difficult that somehow an ego starts to arise from it. So ego and self-identification or any type of identification uh, are closely related. So now I take me as an example. Let's just imagine I take off this rope. I put on my nicest jogging suit or not nice, doesn't matter. And in that training suit, I do the, the average type of talks. Okay, I let my hair grow a little bit longer. The point is, nobody would even listen. People initially start to listen more carefully if I come like this. If I wear a robe and if I'm fulfilling some type of image that people have about what they either call a master or a monk or whatever it is. So, wearing these robes, wearing these uh, accessories here, having this type of haircut, having a certain vocabulary that I'm talking in, this is for me also the pure expression of ego. It's the pure expression of something that is like, that I'm identifying myself in. Now the thing is, what do you want to do the whole day long? if you have nothing that you are identifying yourself with. Then it's like you are love and air. There's no identification, you're completely free and open. You have no form. Yeah, identification means something has started to shape a form. And for me, once again, we are living in the world based off form and formlessness. We have form and formlessness. We have things you can grasp and see with the eyes and we have things they are invisible to the eye. Both of these aspects exist in this type of world, in that existence that we are in right now. So for me it's not about getting rid of the ego. For me, there are two points to watch out here. Number one is, in that process of identification, in the choice that you have done for yourself as what you would like to express yourself, identify yourself, for what are you using this ego? Now, I have decided I want to become a Shaolin master. I dress as a Shaolin master. My daily life is filled with stuff that Shaolin is normally uh, known for. From morning till evening, everything for me is about Shaolin. So for what do I use this now for? 
I use it for because I think that this image, the world out there, listens more easily in order for me to transmit something that I think everybody needs to know this. It makes it easier for me to transmit that message when I look like this. But besides that, I don't care at all. Um, I don't know how else to say. It's been a long time that all the trophies and all the certificates and all this type of things, I don't care anymore. Today is the other side of, yes, you can create something like this and then start collecting your trophies at home. That is a different way of using the ego. So I think it is about for what are you using your identification, your ego inside this world? That is the question. And from the past, mainly I think it is self-centeredness that goes hand in hand with this type of egoism that people sometimes are referring to. So if there is a type of person who is identifying himself in such a way that this type of identification is separating him more amongst other people, that is the wrong direction. Because the separation happens almost by itself. The difficult part is bringing what you see is drifting apart. Invest your energy and hold it together. This is always more difficult. You know, so that means if you see two people are having an argument and you don't interfere, it's easy. The, the easy way is they just start separating. You know, the, the fight maybe, the argument becomes bigger and bigger. It's easy, they separate. But to find a way how to combine apparently two different types of opinions, two different types of, mm, of mindsets, how to still figure out a way how they can, let's say, cooperate, coexist. It takes brain power and it takes effort. But it is the solution that holds them together. That is the difference. The ego path is the one with the separation. The difficult part is the one where you always figure out again and again, how can I connect? How can I make people come together? Not how can I make people separate more? It's happening by itself, the separation. I love that. That's a, such a, so we're talking about, I mean, a lot of people feel like it's, a, it's black and white. It has to go. We have to get rid of the ego, but I, I love that. Um, this is, a, this is a one that actually came up quite a few times. Um, what happens when we die? I don't know what's happening with each individual. I can say what my observation, what my view tells me right now. It can't just stop. It can't just stop. Since the beginning that we were born, your heart goes up and down. Your heart pumps the blood. Your lungs, they inhale, they exhale. The stars turn, the earth is turning. It's the constant exchange between up and down, left and right, in and out, day and night. So something that I witness around, something that, is, that we are embedded in, is that existence and that interplay of two forces. In China, in Asia, we call them yin and yang. Now, if I would ask you right now, so how do you call this? Meaning, what, what time of the day do we have? Night, night time. Now, 
Actually, I would now say, but I don't think so. It is night time because we are sitting right now here in, in Otterberg and are localized and are answering from our perspective being here. But let's say the real answer would be it's day and night at the same time. It's based on from which perspective are you talking about. Now the funny part is it has always been like this. But things seem different for us. We think that right now we are alive. Right now this is life. We are alive. Later, hopefully, 50 years later, then comes death. So what is it that we are, let's say, thinking that life and death is something which happens chronologically, one after another? Who is saying? And it happened many times in the past, that life and death, both of them, is here right now. You, so in, in the media, every day it happens. People die from one second to another, out of whatever reason. It's unlikely things can fall from the sky right onto you. It's also finished. The point is how we come up with the idea that death would be something that comes way after. So one way how I took this thinking process out for myself and what it means for me is automatically when some thought like this gets really deep into you, what automatically happens is you appreciate the lifetime right now more and you are more careful about what you do. Those two things automatically start to arise in the moment this thought enters into your flesh and blood. Yeah. So, and therefore, I prefer to not even think in these terms of death comes later, what comes later. I focus on what I can do right now with what has been given to me. This is what matters to me. Because what, what should I say? I think it's not going to happen if you have a person who during the lifetime is used to waste a lot of energy, waste a lot of lifetime. Even if you give him an afterlife, it's going to be the same. Because why else? From where should this switch of mentality suddenly come? So waiting for better times to come, that you change something about you, is not going to happen. It's an illusion you might think you're putting yourself into. You want to bring out something good, something, the better version about yourself, it's not going to happen in the next life. <laughs> what you do right now, this is what you take to whatever going to come afterwards. And this is now really also the reason why there are existing so-called Qigong methods, energy cultivation methods, aiming in exactly that. Um, how I express this? If you are living no, it's, it's easy explained. If you are smoking a lot, if you are taking a lot of drugs, if you are taking uh, a lot of intoxicants, and then right now you start to have a child, your child gets part of this information that you have embedded first of all into your body. At the same time, if you are educating, training your body, your mind in such a way and fill your body up with information, let's, let's say positive information, and then you pass it on. Also this type of information goes to your, uh, goes to your child. So the better you are developing yourself, the more easy it is going to become for your child to go on, 
because he has already something that you, let's say, um, worked for, yeah? that you developed already. So everything that you are attaining, I think it is not getting lost afterwards. It's not getting lost. You can build up upon it. For me, this means, for example, how can it be? Sometimes child are born nowadays and you realize they have a super, a super high, let's say, uh, resonance with music. How come that they just saw the instrument the first few times and then, and then they already like, it's strange. It's too good to, to, to that it's the first time. Well, because it probably is not the first time. And now, just for the question that you, that some people might be thinking. So, what you're saying is that from generation to generation, there is something being passed on. Of course, it's like this. It's just what we know is our DNA, our genes, they definitely have some type of information being passed on in relation to our skin color, in relation to the shape of our face, the shape of our nose. Because you and me, we have never met our grand, 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 grandfathers. But if you would see a picture of him, you would recognize there is something similar between you and him. So five, six, seven generations and still something is passed on physically wise. Yeah, and I think it's not just physically wise. I also think something is passed on when it comes to spiritually wise. So if you develop yourself in a certain spiritual way in this lifetime already, I think it has some effect for future generations. Yeah? And this is like the whole idea why for me personally I do this type of practices because I think if you want to travel far, like a spaceship, you need a lot of fuel one day. You need a lot of energy one day. And what is this Qigong about? Learning to nourish yourself with Qi, with energy. So to a certain extent in this type of practices, the reasons why you still see people doing these breathing exercises, people are still um, crazy sometimes about this Qigong is because it's a very essential and fundamental practice for us in Asia to also, let's say, increase your, uh, yeah, your energy. And the more full you are, the more energized you are, the more far you can travel. So I don't know where and what's going to come after, after life. I just make sure right now that I do my practices and that whatever comes, I need to be ready. I don't know what's going to come. Thank you so much for watching. I'm curious, which was your favorite quote or lesson or teaching? Comment down below. We have some incredible projects planned with Shi Hong Yi and also the headmaster of the Shaolin Temple USA. So please hit the notification bell and the subscription button if you want to be notified of more stuff like that. We have over 100 new episodes coming to the YouTube channel in 2024. Uh, that's 100 new podcast and interview episodes coming. So please stay subscribed, stay supporting, stay active in the community and be a part of the Inspire Change movement. Thank you for watching. And if you want to support us, head over to mulliganbrothers.com where we're having an end of year sale. Code 2024 at checkout gets you buy one, get one free across everything on the website, including the Not A Journal, the success journal that actually is a success where you reaffirm your goals every single day. You write them down, break them down and achieve them. And also the Memento Mori post the posters that remind you you're going to die. That's my poster with 30 years plotted out. I fill in a box every single year. I've got one at home on the fridge as well and I, I fill it in. And it's humbling to understand that there is a square on there that I one day will not fill in. I don't know where it is. It might have been the one I filled in this morning. But that to me motivates, empowers me and also makes me live with passion and purpose in my life. Thank you to everybody who's watching. 
it is the end of year. There's some great videos coming. So please tune in and uh, I'll see you in the next one. Peace. Number one to really avoid is self-questioning and having too much doubts about yourself. And the other four hindrances, let's say, is also um, easily expressed. Don't get caught and carried away too much by positive emotions.